I'm Carla Hughes, and I'm a local potter and artist who lives in Harlingen, Texas. Today, I'm going to show you how we go from this lump of clay to this coffee cup. Okay, so here we go. This is my wheel, and on top of it, I have a bat, which sits on the wheel head. Um, some potters will throw directly on the wheel head, but I don't like to lift the pots off. I like for them to keep their, their just thrown shape. When you lift a pot off, it can change the shape of them some. So I go ahead and use a bat. Lots of potters do. Some people even lift them off the bats. I don't know. So this guy goes right in here like this. And this here is a half pound of clay, which is the size I use for my coffee cups. Um, Clay, when you get it from the distributor, comes in uh, 25 pound sacks. And so I will cut a whole 25 pounds into half pound balls at a time, uh, weigh it out and bag it back up so that it's ready for me to throw without having to stop to re-weigh and cut and everything else. Um, my bat's a little bit damp. I'm just gonna push it around a little bit, break up that surface, just because um, it's been sitting in the bag for a while and clay tends to get stiff on the outside edge. So throw this down on here, make sure it's attached. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna seal that bottom edge to the wheel head, to the bat. And once that is attached properly, I'm gonna do what's called centering. Um, we'll push the clay up into a cone shape, like this. You can see how my hands are kind of jumping around. It's not very smooth. Well, centering helps make it smooth, helps get it right in the middle of the bat so that you can throw a pot that is nice and even. Take some practice. This is where you learn how much pressure you've got to put on your clay, what kind of muscles you have to have. All right, that's pretty close. I'm a, I'm a big fan of it. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to get you close. All right, two fingers, two thumbs right in the middle of the clay, um, right here. And I'm going to push directly down with both thumbs, almost to the bat but not quite, because we want to leave a bottom on our cup. Put a little water in there. Put my fingers down in there. And now I'm gonna pull the clay open to the size of the inside bottom of the cup. You know, so if I was, you know, throwing a tall skinny base, I might stop right there. But we're throwing a coffee cup and we want it to have a good wide base so it won't tip over. We don't want it to be too delicate. We want for people to want to use it every day. Just making sure it's nice and even and that the foot isn't too thick. And now we're gonna pull it up. Always paying attention to that top edge. We don't want it to tear. And sometimes if it gets too dry, it will. Let's do it again. Bring some more of that clay up, slow the wheel down. Okay, that looks good. So now I'm gonna do what gives my cups their shape. Everybody has different things. Some people like really curvy cups with big bellies. I like for mine to have a, a foot on them because I don't carve a foot, so I throw a foot onto it. So I'm just going to push that bottom in while pushing out from the inside. And that gives me my little start. I know it's kind of hard to see on there, but there is a little indentation there. I'm going to clean it up and make it more dramatic with this tool here. This is a rib. They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and materials. You can get them in wood, metal, plastic, rubber, you know, anything. This is the one I like for making my foot down here, so I'm going to put it down on the base 
and I'm going to push with my hand inside, push that clay towards the rib, and bring some of that clay back up. <clears throat> That's all right, but I don't want it quite so curvy. I want it to have a more um, exaggerated sharp look, so I'm going to go at it one more time and refine that a little bit. That gets it a little sharper. Clean up that top a little bit. You want to keep it pretty wet. I keep it pretty wet. Some folks throw real dry and uh, they must be way more practiced than me because I tend to find that the pot will twist too much if I try to throw it too dry. So that looks pretty good to me. I don't mind that it's a little wonky. I like that it's got this, you can see the corner of it right here. Maybe that's a little too wonky guys, come on now. Alright, that looks pretty good to me. It's got a little bit of a belly to it. I'm down for that. So now I'm going to use this homemade tool, sponge on a stick, to get that throwing water out of the inside. You need it pretty dry inside, otherwise that water will just sit there and the clay won't dry. It'll dry real unevenly because this will be all dry up here at the top but not at the bottom and then the top will crack and your bottom will crack. You gotta start all over. So now we're going to take a little piece of a, of a chamois like you would use to clean your car, make it all nice and bright and shiny, just a little piece, and clean up this top edge. You can refine the shape of it a little bit. I like to have it a little bit angled, a slope on the inside and a little bit of an edge on the outside. It's supposed to help like with dribble. My cup still seem to dribble, but not maybe not quite as much. So there we go. Got that. And the last step is to take this tool here. It's called a fettling knife. It's one of, they come in many and different shapes, but this one is uh, shaped kind of like a shark, I guess. It's got a, a needle tool at one end that will fold back in. And then this end here is what I'm going to use. I'm going to put it right down at the edge, cut a little groove. Okay, that's ready. I'm going to take this guy. This is another type of rib. This is a tool made by an artist named Mark Arnold. He makes great pots, you should look him up. I'm going to clean up the bottom of the pot. The sponge leaves a gritty texture that I don't really like. So I just use this tool, this rib here, to smooth that gritty texture back out. Okay, I like that. Now I will use my wire tool, also known as a cutoff tool. I make my own with fishing line and washers because I don't like the um, the store-bought ones tend to be made out of metal and they invariably fray and poke me in the finger and I don't like that. So now I'm going to drag this along the bottom of the pot, cut it off from the wheel. And there we have it y'all. I will pop this out and I will let this sit covered with plastic overnight and tomorrow we can put handles on them. Okay, so we've got that handle setting up and I've made a few more for some other mugs that I made uh, yesterday. I tend to work in series so I'll try to make um, 12 to 20 mugs at a time just so I can get a bunch done. Mugs aren't my absolute favorite thing to make so but people love to buy them so I try to make quite a few at once so that I've got a decent stock of them before going into a sale and then I can open myself up to make bigger fancier things too okay so remember I put my initials there in that spot well my my banding wheel here has lines on it here's one right here I will line that up on the banding wheel uh, usually the one with the star. Let me switch that around. Just so I know where the initials are because that's where I'm going to put my handle. Um, just so everything's lined up. It's more intentional. Like it's obvious I made the choice to line those things up. Um, it's good to 
let your patron or other viewers, art viewers, know that you as the artist have looked at every part of it and touched every part of it and made a decision about every part of your vessel or painting or sculpture, whatever it may be. So here's our handle. See, it's not very floppy anymore. It's still a little damp. I could still manipulate it a little bit. It's not terribly hard. It is quite a bit softer than the mug at this point. This mug is probably like, it's like a drier cheese. Maybe a little bit stiffer than what cheddar cheese might be. This is more like American cheese at this point. <clears throat> so I am going to take this little handle, decide what's the top and what's the bottom. Since I make them kind of C-shaped, they're basically the same. And I'm gonna decide where it needs to go. If I want it to go down low, up high. I tend to kind of put mine right in the middle of the whole thing. Um, from using my own cups and other people's cups over the years, I've learned what I personally like to use um, and what I think looks good. I think that this one is good. Twist it around, take a look at it both ways. Maybe sometimes I think that it's too long for the size of the cup. So I'll trim a little bit off just with my knife. Just slice a little bit. I tend to think a longer handle looks better with a taller cup and a smaller one looks better with these shorter, chubbier ones, which are actually my favorites. So yeah, that'll look about right. So I'm going to take this rib I showed you earlier with the sawtooth, and I'm just going to scratch a little spot in it where the bottom of the handle will go and where the top of the handle will go. Double check. Looks good. And then I'll do it again here. You want your scratch marks to go in the same direction on the cut and on the handle. So I got those little scratch marks there. And I got those little scratch marks there. Okay. Now, just a tiny bit of water helps those little bits stick. Let's we'll start with the bottom. Push it pretty good. You just want to make sure that it attaches really well. Okay. Excellent that in a little bit. Less of a, a U, more of a C. Make sure it looks about the same on both sides. Okay. Now we'll take some soft clay and roll little coils, pinch out a little bit of coil. Not too skinny because I want to add to the, um, the visual weight of this connection. I want it to look strong and I want that handle to look like it just grew right out of the cup. Um, so I'm going to add more clay, push it in really nice and tight down there. A little bit more, see I got a little hole there, so I'll just fill that up with a little bit more. Do the same thing on the bottom. So I'm just using this wood tool. Let's see if I can put it where you guys can see it. It's hard to get enough pressure on there without using my finger. I feel like my hands are just getting in the way. For y'all seeing. But see, I'm just pushing the clay into that crease with my little wood tool here. We're going to smooth it out really well here in a second. I'm going to put just a little bit of water in those seams. Help it stick together a little bit. That's where this tool comes in. 
That's just another rib. You can get them all shapes and sizes, like I said before. You can also cut them down, um, which is what I've done with others. I just happened to find this one and thought it would be interesting to try it. It turns out I really like it. So I'm just going to smooth that clay onto the handle and onto the body because I want it to look like it is all one and that it always existed this way. all the sides, all the spots. You just want that joint to disappear. And it doesn't matter that it looks kind of rough right now because we'll come back in and clean that up in a little while once everything sets up a little bit more. When the clay is really soft, it really wants to move. And so you get it into its general position um, when it's in the soft phase. And then as the water evaporates, it hardens up a little bit and then you can refine a little bit better. And just cut into the edge of that, but I can just smooth that away. And then pick it up. And get that bottom edge. Just the edge. Like I said, I want it to remain really full looking, so I don't want to pull all that clay onto the body or onto the handle. So even though this rib has a nice little point to it, it's kind of hard to get it up into that space inside the handle. So I'll pull my wood tool back out to get back up in there. I'm trying to keep this where y'all can see a little bit. It's hard to show this kind of close-up detail without being a professional camera person. So, I like that. We've got a pretty round looking shape on the inside there. I just want to make sure that that seam disappears and that the weight of that clay stays right there where you want it to be. It just makes that connection more substantial. It's more likely to survive because this cup has to be fired twice. So it's gonna go into a kiln, which is just basically a giant oven. And the first time it goes in, it will go to over 1900 degrees. And that will partially mature the clay so that it can survive the glazing better. Some people don't do it. There are folks who single fire their stuff, um, take it directly to its temperature of maturity, which for this clay is um, about 2200 degrees. In that time, the clay moves a lot. It shrinks and it expands a little bit and then it shrinks again um, because of water content and because of thermodynamics. And so you really want to make sure that all of your connections are put together very well or they will not survive all of that fun exciting physical science okay so it's not super pretty at this point but it is super wet so I don't want to mess with it too terribly much more I'm mean, gonna give it a little extra shaping I want it to stiffen up before I do too much more with it because I don't want it to move a whole bunch. Just taking a second look at that line. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. Okay, so after this stage we decorate and uh, I'll be back. So I make candles by rolling out a small slab of clay. And so just like we started with the cup with a lump of about a half a pound, I'm gonna make this into a little flat slab with a, a rolling pin. 
There's a lot of different ways to make handles. You can roll a coil, which is just like, you know, when you played with Play-Doh and you made snakes, that's a, make a coil, attach it, and you're good to go. There's a thing called pulling handles, which you start out with a carrot shape piece of clay, and then you use a wet hand and just pull it like you would be um, milking a cow. And then there's my preferred method, which is to roll a small slab. So that's about right. I have these little guide sticks that are just wooden dowels um, so that I can get a pretty even consistency on things. Um, I like a relatively thin handle so that your finger can curve around it without too much trouble. So this little slab is going to be plenty to cut for about half the mugs I did. Handles are relatively small. And I just keep moving the clay around so that it gets relatively even on all edges. Like I said yesterday with uh, throwing the pot, you know, as long as you get close enough, you got the shape you want, you got the right thickness so that it's not too heavy. It's good. It doesn't have to be perfect. I have um, some little templates I use for different styles of handles. Like you'll see that this one's a little shorter and a little wider. This one's a little narrower. I've got a really long narrow handle that I like to use for like a, a two or three finger mug when they're like c-shaped but remember yesterday I showed you this mug so we're gonna make a style similar to this maybe a little skinnier so we're gonna use this one okay you just put it right there on there and with a knife clay knife you just cut the handle out Once again, not perfect. Going for a general, same size, same shape on all the mugs, but they're never quite exactly the same, which is one of the things I really love about the way I do this. I'm not looking to mass produce my work. So it's all just a little bit different each time. So now that I've got the handle cut out, I will take my trusty metal rib again make sure the edge is cleaned off and do it carefully because this thing can slice you open um, I'm just gonna run it on the sides and push that side down a little bit I found that um, with a flat handle like this pushing those sides down just a little bit and then putting that on the inside of the curve where your finger would be it gives it a nice finger like shape you know can you see that how that fits in there so then you turn it over and while it's still in your hand just pull that down take that edge off to the other side okay now I'm gonna fold it over and this is where you kind of got to get down on the level you want to really look at your curve see that one finger is going to fit in there nicely which is my preferred handle I make them all kinds of ways because really I get a little bit bored but a one finger handle oh you can't see that is my favorite so we're gonna let that set up just for a little bit so we'll just set it there and let it harden just a tiny bit before we uh, attach it to the mug. So here's one of the mugs that I threw yesterday. <clears throat> and we cut it off from the wheel while it was still on the wheel. And now we will just wrap the wire tool around the bottom again, pull it through, and it'll pop right off. I'm going to put it upside down, <clears throat> scrape this clay off while it's still wet instead of letting it dry hard on there. Makes for less cleanup later. 
And then we're going to take this rib. Oh, so I scraped it with this rib. Remember the green rib from yesterday? This is same company, yellow rib, a little softer. This one's a metal rib. The end of this one's been cut off because I needed it to be shaped differently. Here's another rib. I really like this corner for getting into handles and stuff for smoothing things. And here's an, yet another rib that's more similar to that wood one I showed you, except the edges are like a saw blade. And that's for scratching into the surface of the clay, which can help remove blemishes, or it can help attach things, which we're gonna do when I put the handle on. So first, I'm gonna take this rib here, my old trusty beat up metal one, and just smooth out the bottom. So some potters will uh, carve a foot at this point with some special tools. Um, <clears throat> but I like a flat bottom. I don't, I like it to be nice and smooth on the bottom. Clean up that edge just a little bit. Okay, and then run your finger over it to clean up those lines just a little bit. And then this is called a chop. And it's just my initials carved into a little piece of plaster. Um, made it myself. You can order things like that online. But I'm just gonna put my fingers inside the pot right on the bottom of it and use it as a backstop and I'm gonna press my initials into the bottom right here. Okay, so I do it like that so that if you're looking at the cup this way, you can read the initials. Now, it's time to put a handle on it. Hi, so our freshly handled coffee mugs needed to sit under plastic for overnight and the next day, yesterday, I took them out from underneath the plastic, cleaned up any weird spots on the handles, the rims, the foot, you know, anything that just was rough or might snag or didn't look very good. Um, and then I dipped the cup upside down like this in a big bucket of white liquid clay that I mixed myself. Um, so that I could have a bit of a background um, to put the color on. I like the, I like how the, the red clay will come through the white, let's see. So like, you know, right here where there's a little bloop from putting the handle on, here on the edge where you can see a little bit of that brown clay coming through. And then of course the bottom here, any little spots like that. I really like to see that coming through. There's a little bit on the handle there. Um, just adds dimension to the surface of the cup and uh, all those little marks reminds you of the hands that actually made it that it's not a factory made cup made by a machine to smooth away all the imperfections so after the slip was applied they needed to sit again for overnight uh, just because um, the slip is very liquidy, so we were back to it being very soft and not easy to handle. And now everything is pretty dry. Um, it's still not completely dried out, but that's good because we want it to still be a little damp for what we're about to do. So I'm going to apply colored slip now. So this same white slip that I used to cover the pot initially, I use to mix colors. And I mix them myself because I like to have um, varying shades of the same color and layer those colors up in different ways on different pots. So the first color we're going to put on is a very light blue. And that's going to be right on top of this white slip. And then I'm going to do a star design over that light blue with this super dark blue. Um, I just like that variation in tone. So you'll notice that as I'm putting on this light blue, um, it actually looks green. Can you see that? Um, and that's because the light blue was so light that it was basically the same color as my foundation slip. And I couldn't see where I was putting it, so I added some food color to the slip so I could see where it was going. Now I will start my decoration on by using the same three lines that are on 
my banding wheel that I showed you earlier for using to line up. And it's just so I can divide up the, the surface of the pot pretty evenly. I uh, eyeball a lot of stuff. I'm not looking to measure, make things exact. It's, I like to have um, <clears throat> a little bit of wonkiness. So I'm just doing two big dots with these sponges that I get at just, you know, any supply, craft supply place. And I'm going to put them on all three of my division lines here. Well, I dripped that one. Sometimes when the slip is too liquidy, it will run down the pot, which you just kind of got to deal with. I just leave it. I can sand some of it off later, but um, I'm just going to have to leave it run like that, and that's all right, because I'm going to put more layers on top of it. It's going to be a little bit obscured, but it's also a reminder that this is a hand process. Um, it's not exact. It's not meant to be. Um, I do like it when it's a little cleaner than that, though. But here we go with the third one. And I just use those lines to guide me, to help divide so I can see how everything's going to fit without being too crowded. So I've got my first <clears throat> set in there, and now I'm just going to go right in the middle of those four dots. And put in, see that? I want it to butt up right against the handle. I want the handle to look like it just got pulled right out of this pattern if I can make it happen that way great. If not, not a big deal. There, I ran it again. So my slip is just a little too liquidy, but we're going to run with it. Just wipe it off the bottom of the pot there. All right, so not perfect, not terrible. It is what it is, you know? When you're making a batch of 20 or so, you can stand to have cup will be a little bit weirder. Sometimes those are the ones I keep if I don't like them. Um, and then I get to test out the design, the overall design of the cup. I've, I've got a couple of these in my cabinet and I know that I like them. Um, and I can also that way live with the surface design for a little bit longer to see if I want to replicate it or if um, maybe that's all the design I need. Um, this cup needs to set up for just a little bit. Those blue dots I just added need to dry for a little while. So we'll set that aside and we'll bring over this one I just did a little earlier. See these, it didn't run. Now, this is a little bit harder to see because this, um, the material that goes into a blue slip that makes it blue, cobalt, is actually pink. It changes to um, a blue in the kiln because of a heat process. So this is a sponge, just a regular old kitchen sponge that I cut with a pair of scissors. I use it a lot. It's one of my favorite shapes. Just simple stuff. I've cut some of those sponges on sticks to be bigger stars. I've cut some into ovals and squares. So I'm just putting this star on top of the light blue circle. And then, come on, little focus. There you go. So when it's fired, it will be a light blue circle like this with this dark blue color over the top. So this circle, even though it'll stand out from the white, will be less prominent than the dark blue star on top of it. So once this decoration is done, they are ready to let dry and um, put into the kiln for their first firing. Remember I told you that that first firing will go to about 1900 degrees and it basically takes the clay to halfway maturity so it's more um, durable while you're doing the final glaze stuff. And at that point I will then pour in um, a glaze that I mix myself. Glaze is basically a little bit of clay with um, silica in it and when it melts down it will s form a glassy like surface over the top of the cup 
and that's why the coffee cup I showed you before is glossy because I like them to look like candy um, when I choose to do that it's to like remembering childhood with uh, cartoons and hard candy in my grandma's house and stuff you know referencing those good memories <clears throat> So I'll add that, uh, a colored one to the inside and a clear one to the outside. Um, and then I'll fire it again and you will get the finished product that you see when you go to art fairs and makers markets. And if you uh, hit up Mr. Leonard over in the ceramics department at STC, he can show you all kinds of other examples of how people do this stuff. And he makes some pretty amazing pots himself. He draws on his pots, they're pretty great. So there we go. This cup is ready for it to dry out and get fired. So thanks for going on the journey with me and uh, I hope to see y'all at, uh, at my maker's stand at the next art fair.